Well, first combo of the semester. We're, we're uh, so glad to have you all back. It was, it was relaxing to have you gone for a while, but it, it's better to have you back. And uh, with some big changes, I guess you noticed the security measures this morning. When I came in, I hope it wasn't, was it, I hope it wasn't too inconvenient. Was it bad? Yeah. I would you rather be inconvenienced or be dead? I don't know. But, but uh, <laughs> they, they, they wanted me when I came in. They said it looked like I had something under my suit. I said, that's all muscle. Don't worry about it. So, but I did get wanted. It's, it's everybody. No, nobody's exempt. But today, oh, and the new tower. I um, went up for the first time yesterday. And I feel like I met, I took pictures with half of you. They, so many students went up yesterday that the second elevator at the top overheated and they had to turn it off. So we had to walk up the last three or four stories, but, but it was good to see so many of you up there and um, send me some of those pictures if you, I, I'll put them up. But today, since it's the first convo, I wanted to honor two individuals who who really were instrumental in making Liberty University what it is today. When you walk around campus and you see all the beautiful buildings and, and uh, facilities, I know you're young, but you, you, have to, you have to know that it wasn't always like that. For years, we, we struggled to keep the lights on, keep the bills paid, keep the payroll made. That was part of my job as the uh, general counsel here for years. And there were a lot of people who came beside us to help us one was Dr. Wilbur Peters. He just passed away January 1st at age 95. He founded a, a retail chain called Minnesota Fabrics in the, in the upper Midwest. I don't know how many stores he had, but it was a big chain. He sold it, and he spent the rest of his life using his, his uh, wealth to build churches in Sao Paulo, in Brazil, and, and, uh, and to help Liberty University. He learned Old Time Gospel Hour, with the television ministry that was the main benefactor of Liberty for years, millions of dollars. He later forgave that debt as a charitable contribution. And so we ask you to pray for the Peters family. He was uh, living in Charlotte, Charlotte, North Carolina when he passed away. And, and we, uh, he'll be greatly missed and, and uh, his role here is greatly appreciated. But another individual who is here with us today Dr. Harold Wilmington came here in 1972. He, the first year he came, um, he's such a good Bible teacher that my father actually closed the school for one week and just had him teach one week of nothing but Bible to all the students. It was about 175 students in those days. Matt was, his son was just telling me. And he, um, he went, he's the only person alive, or he he's attended more Liberty, commencements than any other person alive. He, he's only missed one in all the years that we've been in existence, and that was because he had a bad case of gout a couple of years ago, couldn't, couldn't be there. But what he did to, to help Liberty University so much was he, he, formed, he, he created the Liberty Home Bible Institute, which was probably the first distance education program of, it was, it was a pioneer. Not many colleges ever did that before us. And he had over 100,000 students go through that program. And it was a, a correspondence program where, where people could study the Bible at home or they could come here. And he wrote so many books. His Wilmington's Guide to the Bible, I always heard that he, he spent 26 years writing that, that one volume. It's about that thick. And he um, has sold 500,000 million, five, sorry, 500,000, five, what is it? A half a million. That's 500,000, same thing. All right. So he sold a half a million books all over the world, but, but, but his real contribution came through that Bible course because, when, like I, when I said a little while ago that the Old Time Gospel Hour was the main benefactor of Liberty University, it was expensive for Old Time Gospel Hour to be on the air. It cost to, to buy the airtime in every city. There were only three networks back then. It cost a lot of money, and it wasn't always enough contributions to do it. So his Bible courses, he allowed the Old Time Gospel Hour to keep all the tuition money from all those Bible courses. He never asked for a royalty. He gave 100,000 books to Billy Graham's organization. 
didn't ask for anything in return to help the Billy Graham organization raise money. But Harold Wilmington just came to us recently with a new, he's 85 years old, but he's still planning for the future, still working. And Ron, come up, this is Ron Hawkins, our provost. Tell everybody about the new Bible program that Harold proposed to me about three or four months ago. All right, well, thank you to President Falwell for supporting the idea. Liberty has always been about innovation. And uh, with the advent of the internet, it was possible to take the educational experience that we have at Liberty and move it out to hundreds of thousands of students. But we've always dreamed of making the Bible resources, the Bible resources created by Dr. Wilmington and others on the faculty, and pushing them out through the internet and doing it free. Mm -hmm. And uh, so free and all of those resources. And so when we came together with Dr. Wilmington, we pitched the idea to the president and he said, let's go for it. We have an amazing library here. Uh, the JFL library is not only a beautiful building, but inside of it is the technology, digital commons, and whatever we put on digital commons goes out on the internet, is immediately available globally, and so we're taking all of the resources that Dr. Wilmington has created and other members of the faculty and friends, and we're pushing them out to Africa and, and uh, Asia and all over the world free. And so pastors and people who want to study the Word of God will have a resource they've never had before. Thank you, President Falwell, and, and thank and, you, Harold Wilmington. And it's called Project Sword. As he said, it'll be fully accessible, free online. He's excited for the launch of it. He's got a thousand articles already available at the link on the screen. They're going to put up in just a minute. But after he came and proposed this new project to me to provide free online Bible courses to the whole world, he found out he had stage four cancer. And he's been fighting that for the last few months. And he's, he's made progress, much better progress than the doctors predicted. And he's, um, he's here with us today. I wish you'd give him a stand, or give him an ovation. He's a liberty hero. He's always, he's always one of those humble people who never wanted credit for anything. And I always joke that Harold did all the heavy lifting and Elmer Towns got all the credit. But, but, but Harold really is an, an, an unsung hero and is really was just a key component of making Liberty University what it is today. So I'm gonna turn it back over to David Nasser to introduce our guest for this morning. But um, thank you for helping me honor Dr. Wilmington. Thank you. I, uh, I had a member of the press ask uh, earlier this week if there was a theme that really, um, a word or a thought that really um, encompassed this particular semester's convocation schedule. And uh, the answer was pretty simple for me. The answer was, yeah, there are two words that really come to mind. When I think about the guests that God has brought our way in this particular semester, uh, and the first one is perseverance. I think at the end of the semester, you look back and see the idea of perseverance, honestly, the doctrine of perseverance. You'll see the hope of perseverance sewn into so many stories from our guests that are going to come your way. And another one is redemption. And our guest today has really both of those thoughts inside of his story. Uh, we have with us actually a few guests that have come with our guests, and the first one is Dr. Chip Henderson. Uh, Chip and his wife are here with us today, and Chip is the pastor of Pine Lake Church in Mississippi. They have multiple campuses all around the, that state, uh, representing also Oxford, Mississippi, where the Fries family uh, attend. It's one of the fastest growing churches in the country. Uh, he's just a, a really good Bible teacher, and hopefully in years to come, he'll come here on a, another convocation and teach the Word to us. Uh, he, he's an awesome, awesome, awesome expositor uh, of God's Word. 
Uh, he's coming with two church members, uh, Jill and Hugh Freeze, who are joining us. And um, if you are a football fan, especially a college football fan, you're no stranger to uh, what most people believe is one of the great offensive minds uh, of the game, Coach Hill, Hugh Freeze. And I, I want to say this to you. Uh, I've had an opportunity in the last month and a half to get to know the Freeze family a little bit, not just in a couple of meals that we've had together, but just conversations. And um, I've been so impressed with their authentic love for the Lord and their passion, their, their honestly commitment to see God glorified in and through every bit of their story. And we're privileged to get to start this season with them. We're going to watch this video, and then Coach is going to come up and give us a talk that he's given many times, but this time it'll mean something very new to him. And then we're going to sit down with his wife, Jill, and Pastor Chip as well, and have a very um, honest conversation together. All right, let's watch this together. The story of Hugh Freeze is a story of mountaintops and valleys. From the peaks of a high school coaching career spotlighted by the Academy Award winning movie, The Blind Side, to becoming the head coach of a powerhouse SEC team that would go on to win three bowl games, break into the AP top 10 of nationally ranked teams, and beat a top ranked Alabama, not once, but twice. But what does it look like to be a big time coach and make a big time mistake? to move from the mountaintops of victory to the valley of resigning for personal misconduct. On July 20th, 2017, Hugh Freeze resigned from his position as head coach at Ole Miss. Today, for the first time since Coach's highly publicized resignation, the Freeze family has decided to tell their story in front of a live audience. This is a story of brokenness and restoration, a story of faith and forgiveness. Before we sit down with the Freezes and their pastor, we've asked Coach to give his life message entitled, Making It Happen. This is a talk he's given hundreds of times to audiences ranging from athletes in the locker room to CEOs in the boardroom. After all he's been through, the principles of his life message mean more to him than ever before. This is why Coach's famous Making It Happen talk now has a new addition to the title. Making It Happen. But what if? Liberty, let's welcome Hugh and Jill Freeze. Well, thank you, uh, Liberty. Thank you to uh, Dr. Falwell and to uh, Pastor David, who's become a dear friend, and, and for you uh, just coming to hear our story. I'm humbled and certainly unworthy to uh, for a moment like this, but I do believe that what uh, God has taught Jill and I and our daughters uh, through the last couple of years, I think it has merit for, for many of you that will go through things in the future. So let me jump right in. My time is limited, and I want to get to the, to the main points. In 1929, there was a Rose Bowl game. It was Georgia Tech versus California. The center for California was a, 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 was a sophomore starting center named Roy Regal. It was a bad weather game, and Roy snaps the ball on a given play, and as he is doing his job and blocking for the run that was called, it is a lineman's dream. The ball is on the ground. And he scoops the ball, and he starts running. And I'm sure in Roy's mind, he's thinking, man, this is a dream of mine, and I've gone five yards and no one's tackled me, and, and I go 10 yards, 15 yards, 20 yards, true story, 30 yards, 40 yards. And I'm sure he's thinking in his mind, man, I should have been the tailback. Coach had it all wrong. I shouldn't have been the center. 65 yards he runs before he is pulled down from behind by his own teammate. He was running the wrong direction. They tackled him on the two-yard line before he entered the end zone. Still their ball, they couldn't get it out. They have to line up to punt. The punt is blocked, and halftime comes, and they're down two to zero. 
I try to put myself in biblical characters' uh, shoes or in Roy Regal's shoes, and I'm sure he's sitting in the locker room now with a towel draped over his head like, man, I've embarrassed my family. I've embarrassed my school. I've embarrassed my team. I've let so many people down. I don't know if we'll score again because of the weather, and we're down two to zero because I made a mistake. And I'm sure he's sitting there wondering, what, do I even want to go back out for the second half? When I look back on my 2017, I see Roy Regal in me. I've taken pride in making it happen in this talk that I've done many times, and, and we have its for everything. If you ask any player that's played for me what our offensive it would be, they would say to you, it is to be a fundamentally efficient scoring machine. If you ask any coach that's ever coached for me, they would say the recruiting it is to develop dynamic relationships with the student athlete and all those involved in his decision-making process. If you ask me where my personal it would be, it would be to use the platform that God has given me to impact and influence people for His kingdom. And yet when I look back on my 2017, and I don't know how many of you would say, you know what, I'd like to forget that year and move on to the next. But just like coaching a football team, there are core values that we built that team around, that I've built my life around, that I have to reflect upon and see not only what went right for so many years, but what went wrong. And it's based on the word film, because you know when I'm watching film with a player or a team, the film never, ever, ever lies. And so when I look back on my 2017 in hopes of moving forward and learning something from what went wrong and what went right, I look at the word F and I say faith. That's one of our core values. And if you ask any of our players that have ever played for me, they would say to you, faith is believing in something bigger than yourself. And I don't know what that is for you, but there's going to come a point in your life where you will need something bigger than yourself. And if you're a part of a team and you need the right guard to do his job, you need the receiver to do his job, you need the coach to do his job, and something bigger than yourself is important. And my world got rocked in 2017. And all the walls came crumbling down. when what I thought was a private sin that I had struggled with confessed to my wife, to two of my friends in 2016, what I thought was private and I was dealing with and was in my rearview mirror in the past when it became public knowledge in July of 2017. And my world crumbled. And the question started being asked, man, is his faith real? Is his faith genuine? I begin to ask, is it possible that you can have a genuine faith and also have a season in your life that you struggle with a sin? And I start studying the Scripture, and I find out that it's true for every single believer. Every single one of us are broken, and we have an issue. That is why we have faith. And I'm coming before you today to say before anything else I talk about, man, we have to make sure that the faith is ours. Is it mine? Or is it my parents? Is it real? Is it genuine? Is it solid? And what I have found in going through when my walls came crumbling down around me is that the faith that I stand on through the Son of God, Jesus Christ, it is a solid rock a solid foundation, and when all hell is breaking loose around you and everybody has their opinion about what's going on, and you know that you've hurt the heart of God, His love never changes, ever. And you can stand and sing that it's yours, and on Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand, and when the winds and the waves they come. When I'm talking to my team about faith, we talk about go-to players. And we're evaluating the film of the last game before we move on to the next one. Did we get it to our go-to players enough? Did we ask those players to do what they're capable of doing, that they can excel at? 
And I don't know what you've been through in 2017, and I don't know what's coming your way, but there'll come a point where you need something bigger than yourself. And I would just simply ask, what's your go-to? Who's your go-to player? I have found mine, and man, at the bottom of it all, that rock is solid. The I in film is for integrity. I have a total new appreciation for integrity. If you walk into any team room and you ask our players that we've coached, what is integrity? They'll say, we tell each other the truth. You see, integrity is not always doing what's right. If that's the case, would anyone ever have integrity? But integrity is when something is not done right. It is owning it. It is being accountable for it. It is seeing it for what it is. And when you have that, when you have that integrity, it leads to confession, and it leads to a brokenness. And that's where I found myself. After I found my faith is solid, I found myself in 2016 having to confess something that I never in a million years thought I would, and I didn't honor my wife totally. We do a drive chart in football, and man, we'll, we'll chart what happened on that drive, what went wrong, what went right. And there's a lot of times, Pastor David, that you score touchdowns and you really probably shouldn't have. It was a broken play, and somebody just made a play and threw it down there, and, and that can create a false pride. Man, man, we're averaging 40-something points a game in the Southeastern Conference, man. We're rolling. Well, I hate to break it to you, but maybe you have a little false security, false pride. And that's where I found myself. And I want to tell you, I don't know what you're going through, but I have dealt with players and kids your age my whole life. And the lie that we have that I bought into, that I allowed is, man, I can white knuckle through something. I can be isolated, and I don't know what you're going through today, but you don't have to do it alone. You can email me, Pastor David, there's so many resources you have here in your small groups, but don't go at it alone. It will take you down a road you don't want to go. Confess it. Own it. It leads to brokenness, and what I've discovered about brokenness is I studied the people of David and Saul, two kings, both sinned, both said, I've sinned. One said, let's don't talk about it and tell anybody, and let's, let's blame other people. One said, you know what, I've hurt the heart of God, and I confess it, and I, I'm broken. One was called, said he had a heart after God's own heart. Integrity. Owning it and not doing it alone. The L in film is for love. If you ask our players what that stands for, it would be the ability to handle the inconveniences that come with relationships. And trust me when I tell you, if you're in any relationship long enough, there'll be inconveniences. In this room, we're gathered from all different cultures, backgrounds, religions, and man, it, it's, it's different. You put a team in a room, it's different. And love is the ability to handle all of those inconveniences. And there's two sides to that coin, and I found myself on one side where I had to say to people that I love, I am sorry. Please forgive me. And today's really the first day that I can tell the faith family, I am sorry. Please forgive me. Thank you. Thank you. There's another side to love, is you may be on the other side of it, and you may, may be needing to forgive someone. If you look at the story of the prodigal son, one son has sinned, squandered his inheritance, but says, I'm picking myself up and I'm going to the Father. And the father accepted him, loved him, forgave him. The older brother had a problem with that and wasn't quite as willing to forgive. And I want to tell you, I've experienced such forgiveness from my family, my wife. She's the real hero. My kids, my daughters, my pastor, my friends, my family. I've also seen the other side of it with people that are not quite as willing to forgive. And I just want to tell you, Jill and I have a new appreciation for grace. We have a new appreciation for mercy. 
We have a new appreciation for compassion. And I believe if you're a follower of Christ, man, He has called us to love. By this they will know you are my followers, you are my disciples because of your love for one another. And it may be you need to ask someone for forgiveness like I had to. It may be you need to forgive someone. It may be you need to get dirty in the ditch and, you know what, stand up for someone. Or maybe say, you know what, I have my, my daughter Reagan loves me more than she should probably. And she wants to fight every time there's an article written that's not accurate. She wants, to, she wants to fight every time something is said on the keyboard warriors, on the, on the Twitters and message boards and, and all of those things that take things and run with them that may not exactly be true, but what I've had to tell her is, baby, your dad did something wrong, and he has to be accountable. It may not be what's written, but he has to be accountable. But God's called us to love, and love is being willing to forgive to ask for forgiveness, to say you're sorry. And then you get to move to mental toughness, the M in film. And as we watch that, my kids would say, my players would say that mental toughness is the secret sauce. It's the ability to get up the next day and do it over and over and over and over again with the same passion, with the same enthusiasm, with the same effort. And when we're watching that film of the last game before we move on to the next one, or we're watching the film of my life before I move on to the next year, you have to ask, man, is my effort going to be the same? Is my desire to succeed going to be the same? Is my desire to grow as a follower of Christ going to be the same? And you have to do it over and over and over again. You might stump your toe. You might fall off a cliff. You may make a mistake, but do you have the wherewithal to have the mental toughness to get up the next day, follow and seek after Him? How do you do that? My answer has been community. It's been getting with people, man, that just dive into the Word of God and you find out what it says about you as a child of the King, not what somebody else says about you. It also brings accountability around you, and you have that, that possibility here to do that, and you have pastors here like I have who's willing to pour into your life the truth about what God says about you. And it creates in you that mental toughness and that attitude to be able to play the next play or move forward. You see, the devil wants you to stay where you are defeated in failure. Look, failures are not final. You can move forward by the grace of God, and it can develop an attitude in you because of the time you spend with that group that you can have the mental toughness, you know what, I'm going to get up today and surrender again and surrender again, and to do it again, and to go love again on people. I cannot control what people say, what people think, nor can you. But I can make up my mind, and my mind is set. It is settled. My eyes are clear. My heart is full. My feet are pointed forward. And I am looking forward with thanksgiving to what God has for me and my family next because of His great love and His great forgiveness. And you can do the same in 2018, for I know the plans He has for us, and they are good. And all things work together for your good. And no eye has seen and no ear has heard, nor can any mind conceive all that the Lord has planned for those that love Him. So I look forward with anticipation and thanksgiving, and you can do the same. Roy Regal, we left him last. He was sitting in the locker room at halftime, embarrassed. I've been there. You ever been there? Sometimes we get hurt because of our own doing. Sometimes it's circumstances, sometimes it's someone else. The hurt is all real either way. And he's sitting there debating. Coach Nibs goes to him at halftime and says just a short sentence to him, and he says, hey, Roy, 
You can't do anything about the first half. It's over. But you can finish well. He goes back out the second half, and they play the second half of that Rose Bowl. And I wish I could tell you today that he went back out and made some great play, and they won the game. They didn't. They actually got beat eight to seven, and obviously the safety was a critical, critical play in it. And they lost the Rose Bowl on that play. A few years back, I had the privilege of leading a football team to the Peach Bowl, one of the New Year's Six Bowls. And one of the events that you do there is you go visit the College Football Hall of Fame. And I found a very unique thing there. Guess whose name is in the College Football Hall of Fame for the Rose Bowl Hall of Fame? Roy Regal. Because of the way he finished. He finished well. And I hope somehow, in some way, that you can take the faith that I've talked about today that's real and genuine and strong and enduring, the integrity I've talked about to where you own whatever it is you see, you call it what it is, you don't do it, go at it alone. Love, learn to ask for forgiveness, learn to forgive, and then create mental toughness through community and studying God's Word. And believe in what it says you are, which is develops an attitude in you that you can stand forward and say, I'm moving forward to whatever God has next. We could sit here and argue all day the qualities that make up the right kind of person. One that I don't think anyone could disagree with is I think the right type of person has the ability and the wherewithal to finish. And that doesn't mean that they don't stump their toe. It doesn't mean they don't fall down. Look at Peter. Look at, look, at, look at Paul. Look at David. Look at on and on and on. But they have the ability to finish. And Jill and I just came today to share our story briefly with you and to encourage you that by God's grace and by His power, we can all finish well. Thank you for letting me share. Powerful. We, um, we wanted to sit down just for a few minutes uh, with Jill as well and Pastor Chip, and so they're going to come up and uh, we're going to have just a few minutes together of conversation and that I actually think is full of instruction for you as a college student as well. Uh, I think guys are going to come out with the stools for us for just a second, but uh, let me just say this as they come up. Um, about a month and a half ago, uh, I sat across this guy that I'd gotten to know the day before. And uh, we started to have a conversation, and he told me that uh, he was uh, from Mississippi. And um, I asked him, just in conversation, um, do you know Coach Freeze? And he said, well, I don't just know him. He's my accountability partner. And he said, uh, what people don't know is about a year before everything that went public to the world happened, I was with him with Ben Crane, who is our other accountability partner, the golf pro. And he said, and the three of us were together, and that's when... Uh, the Holy Spirit just convicted um, Hugh to just tell his accountability partners about the struggle that he'd been having in his life. And he said, and we began to pray with him and help him. He went and told his wife, and he said, and so all of that happened. There was great victory. There was uh, accountability and all of that. And then a year later, that's when everything just kind of came out to the papers. And there was so much in the rearview mirror of this uh, family, but then all of a sudden he became front and center for the whole world for them to deal with. And he said, I can tell you I've watched them grow in this season more than I've ever seen him grow in, in his faith. And that's when I knew that this was real, and that's when I knew that I wanted to put them in front of you to, to learn from. Because I hope that you understand that, um, that all of us, all of us underestimate the power of sin and overestimate the power of grace when we think that we got this on our own that, and that we're immune to falling, or that when we do fall, we think that God can't really bring restoration to us. Amen? And so can we just bring Jill, and can we put our hands together for her and Dr. Henderson, and uh, can you come on up as well, brother? Um, I'd love to start 
with you, uh, Dr. Henderson Chip. Uh, man, you, you're a pastor of a church with, uh, I think, over 10,000 members, and so surely, uh, brother, you, you sit with families all the time who are part of your church body who are going through whatever that is a valley. Sometimes the valleys are um, mom's got cancer and we've got to navigate through that. Sometimes it's self-inflicted uh, sin. Sometimes it's uh, whatever it might be, right? The loss of a daughter like Portia who just passed away. Um, but it's rare when, when that moment uh, the whole world knows about, small, especially in a small community like Oxford, Mississippi, where you're the pastor of a congregation there and one of your church members is going through something. Uh, give us some insight in that. How do you shepherd through that? And maybe even on a more personal note, how did you shepherd through that uh, with, with this family? And what you said, David, that is key is uh, th these folks are a part of our, our faith family. And so while the world may know them as uh, Coach Hugh and Jill Freeze, I know them as my faith family. And so it's with that that I look at their life and see that, man, these folks, for whatever you may or may not know about them, I've watched their faith journey, and they are, they are real and true in their faith. Uh, I've seen them be faithful to church every Sunday, same spot, looking out on the right. They come in on the left. Every Sunday, no matter what time they got in the night before, after a, an away game, win or loss, Coach, Jill, the girls are there. I've, I've watched him uh, as he's shared from his resources in, in Af South Africa, in Haiti, taking players. I, I've, I've watched what he's done in the Mississippi Delta. You don't fake that kind of stuff. I've watched him in community, two different small groups. Jill's in multiple small groups. They're a part of our faith family. And so when I come alongside these guys, this is not coming alongside of someone who is anything other than a brother and a sister in Christ who are hurting. And so my two thoughts are, are these. Number one is I wanted them to experience the grace Hugh just talked about. That, man, it's one thing to know that God is gracious and that God gives grace, and He does, but there's, there's going to be a moment in your life where you need the grace of God to be tangible and real. Because a lot of people who are your best friends when everything is great will walk smooth out on you whenever stuff starts hitting the fan. And I, I wanted him, him to know that there, was, there were people who loved him and didn't care. I don't care what he does. It's beside the point. I don't care if he ever coaches against. It's beside the point. He's part of our flock. He's one of our sheep. And I just wanted him to know somebody cared about him. And I've told him, I look back over our text messages over a couple of years and, and sharing back and forth, quiet time, stuff like that. But I, I sounded like a broken record since July the 20th. How are you? Every seven days, man, how are you? You're on my mind. And it's embarrassing in one way to think back and think, what, what was I thinking? But I just wanted him to know I loved him and that God loved him and that, no, that I hadn't given up on him. But the second piece of that is where there's a side of which I come alongside of Hugh and love him and tangibly love him. Man, my heart has been to shepherd him toward the fullness of what brokenness really looks like. My heart is not to get him back into a coaching position. My, my heart is not to get him restored to where he once was. That's, that's, not, that's not the win. Yeah. The win is to shepherd him through this valley to what was, what is that place of vulnerability and, and, and uh, brokenness or what was jacked up inside of you that makes you open to that kind of thing. And to really keep bringing him back to the core values of his faith, his love for Jesus, true to himself, love for his wife, honoring his family. Those are the things that are near to his heart. Those are the things he's asked me to hold him accountable to. And so I've tried to shepherd him toward that. Anything past that, whatever, whatever God may or may not do, it'll rise and fall on the, the genuine repentance and brokenness and, and walk that he has with Jesus. And so, I mean, that's been the heart uh, that I've had to pastor this family, is to, to pastor and shepherd them toward the grace and love of Christ, and then toward his redemption in the middle of it. So you've got a family here who's obviously uh, deeply invested in church planning when you planted that congregation there in Oxford. They're big time givers, they're, they're teaching in their own home community groups, and then they need um, they've, been, they've been like making deposits spiritually into the church community there, and then now they need withdrawals from you. But what do you say to someone who says, that didn't happen with my family, or the first time we saw our pastor was the first time we actually like went to church. Uh, we come from a very broken place. What, what, what kind of hope would you give someone who didn't, who didn't have a lot of um, anchors in the past that really helped them for futureness, uh, future grace? Uh, but somebody who's just looking even today and going, I don't have a pastor. I, I don't have um, a community yet. Yeah. Well, I'd say to you, first of all, give your pastor grace, because pastors aren't perfect either. Yeah. 
And so, you know, I hope and pray that you do have that experience. Wherever you are, wherever you're watching from, I do pray that you have that experience. Your pastor can't touch everybody all the time in some situations. And so, you know, Andy Stanley's the guy, I think, who coined the phrase, do for one, what you wish you could do for everybody. And so, you know, I was able to do for, for them. But you know what? I was on the phone before I got, got here yesterday, on the phone with another family in my church y'all have never heard of. You, you'll never hear of them walking through a valley. And so coaching and loving them, I think that's a part of it. Is you, if you're going into ministry, if you are a pastor, love the people that God puts in front of you as much and as often as you can. But I would say to all of you guys, listen, I really have not been Hugh's pastor nearly like Jody Smelzer has been his pastor. Not nearly like the guys in his small group on Tuesday morning have been his, have been his come along and, and the people in their, in their couple small groups. So that's what I would say to you. Listen, be in community. Wherever you are, find some brothers and sisters in Christ. Don't put that on your preacher, that he has to be the one, or uh, they have to be the one who meets your every need. No, we are a faith family. And you're a part, I pray that you would find your place in the faith family. And that's not a pyramid where one guy serves everybody or everybody serves the one, but we're a circle where we ought to love and give grace toward each other. That's when, that's when faith becomes what I believe Christ wanted it to be, where we're washing each other's feet and loving each other. Absolutely. So even if you're not a part of a, of a community and a faith family, that, that's our heart for you here at Liberty, that you don't see this as your only community, that this is one community you belong to. Uh, even if tonight you go to a community group on your hall, that that is just one facet of many communities you belong to. If you're on the tennis team, you're part of that community, you're part of the one in your dorm, and then hopefully you have a local church, whether it's TRBC or Christ Community here in the, in the city, and you belong to a community of people that are walking out life with you. And if, if you haven't been, it's not too late. And if you've made mistakes, it's still not too late. That's the beauty of the community of the people of God, that we are the people of grace and truth. Um, Jill, the word that continues to just come out of your mouth when I talk to you is the presence of God. It seems like that's one thing that God's really brought front and center. Will you talk a little bit about what God's been teaching you recently about just His presence? Yeah. It's... It's so much. He's teaching me so much, and it's, it's a journey on His presence. And it, it started, um, obviously, it's His presence that's everywhere all the time, and, and I've experienced His presence that He's answered prayers. He's really been working on me for the past, like, maybe five or six years, um, just building me to be a better prayer. But through this, I've experienced His presence um, in layers, in such a, in such a different way than ever before. And it started with just the sheer pain and, and just in that place of you're hurt so much and, and you feel yourself kind of going in that pit of despair. And I can remember that moment of just screaming in my head, my prayer, this very eloquent prayer, God help me. That was it. Like, God help me. And immediately it was like, are you going to focus on your hurt or are you going to focus on your healing? And I'm like, I, I want healing. And, and in that, immediately, I was able to see um, him, his heart. Like, I've lived with him for 25 years. This man is the godliest man I have ever known. I am who I am in Christ because of this man and the impact and influence he has had on me. Like, I know this man. I know his heart. I know he loves God, and I know he's going to do what it takes to get right with God. And so, for that, it was easy in that moment, I forgive you like immediately. And that was the beginning of my healing. Like it was instant forgiveness for him. And it led me to, I could see he made some bad trades. You know, you made some bad trades. And God in his greatness, instead of me focusing on his bad trades, he said, Jill, what are your bad trades? And I'm like, ugh, you know, I got a lot of bad trades. And he's forgiven me a whole lot more than I've had to forgive him over 25 years. And the beginning of that forgiveness was very selfish. My obedience was a very selfish driven, like, I want God's goodness. I want his, I, you know, you're forgiven as much as you forgive. So I'm going to forgive a lot because I want a lot, you know. And it was, I want to obey because I don't want the consequences. And what God taught us is that godly sorrow is, it's about the heart of God. And so no longer do I want to obey him because I want his blessings, and no longer do I want to obey him because I don't want to suffer. I want to obey him because I don't want to hurt the heart of God. And so he started teaching that my sin is serious. Every bit of my sin is serious. It may not have the same consequences, and I can't judge my sin on consequences. I judge my sin on what I'm doing to the heart of God, and every bit of it grieves him. 
And then it showed me that I was believing in. Yeah. So I was believing lies. I could look at him and I could automatically see in the, many, in the beginning like he was believing the lies of, of Satan, that he's not worthy, that he's blown it, that this is, we can't get past this. And immediately like God just shored me up and I'm like, oh no, like we're getting through this. Like you are a good man. You are a godly man. This isn't over. Like we have a glorious unfolding that's coming. And so I was ready to battle that. Um, and just his presence of just working every time Satan wanted to bring the pain, like God would just help me focus on him. Okay, what about me? Like, what do you need to do with me? What is my lesson? What do I have to learn? Where, where do I need healing? Where do I need to quit grieving your heart, God? Where, where do you want to work on me? And when I quit focusing on him and the pain, like, it's just healing. And it was powerful. And so now I'm hearing the voice of God. Like, I'm the girl who's been in every Bible study for the past 49 years trying to hear the voice of God. Like, God, I want to hear you. I need to hear you. I don't hear you. I need to hear the voice of God. And now I can hear Him. I can hear Him speak to me. And it has given me a hunger and a taste and a thirst for His presence. And I want His power. I want His peace. I want His provision. I want His protection. But the only thing I need is His presence. Like, I need it. And because I need it, and He tells me, if you seek me, you will find me. And I am seeking His presence. And there are times when I'm seeking His presence, and I feel God like the angel armies, and I am ready to go. I'm warriored up. Let's go. I feel that presence. And there are times I am broken on the floor. And he is picking me up, and he is putting me in his little father lap, and he is rubbing my hair, and he is pouring his love over me and singing over me and his presence. And I walk out of there with peace and with rest. And there are other times that he is teaching me his presence, like, Jill, you hunger and thirst for my presence. Do you see this wasn't a game changer? This was a life changer. So now I want you to share that. So it started with my girls, like I've heard them say the very same things that I have said. Ah, oh, God doesn't talk to me that way. Man, I've never heard God speak to me that way. He just, I don't feel God like that. And so I am circling them in prayer like, God, let them see you, let them feel you, let them hear you. Like it's a life changer. And so then when we knew we were coming here, I was like, oh my goodness, I've got 15,000, you know, Reagans and Jordans and Madisons and whatever. God, they need to, they need to feel your presence. Like, I'm praying that you get His presence, that you seek His presence. You can get there in thankfulness. You can get there in praise. You can get there in brokenness, but you have to seek His presence. And I want you to hear a word from God today. Every one of you in here, every one of you needs a word from God. I don't know if you need a word of direction. I don't know if you need a word of healing. I don't know if you need a word of forgiveness. I don't know. You may need a word that, of salvation. You have not. You can't hear another word because you, you haven't heard the word of salvation. Every one of you in here needs a word from God. And I'm telling you, He did not send His Son on the cross to die for you to not speak to you. He has a word for you. So get into His presence. It's, it's life-changing. And if you ever experience it, you will now. It's hard to crave something you've never taste, tasted. And so I'm praying that today you just get a taste of His presence and that you will crave it and you will never want to go another day. You won't go another day without His presence. Amen. Amen. Amen, sister. You said the word brokenness. Uh, I started counting a couple times in and you said it like four more times. And I think His presence. Uh, it sometimes comes through to the cracks of brokenness. And, and, and the psalmist says, let the bones you have crushed rejoice. The psalmist in the same psalm says, against you and only you, Lord, have I sinned. And inside of that, there's this beautiful thing where God doesn't break us uh, so that we'll stay broken. God breaks when we're heading in the wrong direction so He can reset us towards the right. Can you talk to me just uh, and, and everyone about brokenness for just a second before we close out in prayer? I think the Lord's speaking to a lot of people today who just need to cultivate being in the presence of God, but their pride is keeping that, and brokenness can break through that. Yeah, yeah I've, you know, pride is a—it uh, wants to keep you from being in that broken spot, and uh, 
either either the pride or isolation from other community, which I think is also a sign of pride that, uh, you know, I can't really talk about that, or, or a lot of us are raised in in uh, churches that they give you a bunch of dues, but it wasn't, it was never okay to come in and say, hey, I, you know what, I, I've got a struggle and, and, and I need a little help uh, in yeah. dealing with this. And, um, and you can then guilt and shame and all of those things can set in. And the only true way to freedom from that is, is brokenness. And, you know, I, I've struggled with, um, you know, why did a private matter between Jill and I, that, that uh, I believed I was handling the right way, have to go public and, and then take so many different lives of, it, of its own. And the, the real answer I keep getting in my spirit is so that I could really experience true brokenness and then use it for, for His glory. And I, I just believe that brokenness is agreeing with God daily that anything that's outside the boundaries of me following him breaks his heart. Amen. And uh, that, that brokenness leads you to, uh, to obedience. Amen. Dave, I don't usually chime in. I'm not a pastor on things like this. But I just want to say, ch convocations like this is what makes me so proud of Liberty students. Because yeah. Yeah. so many Christians today are so-called Christians. You read Twitter comments, read any. They're the most judgmental, mm -hmm. unforgiving mm -hmm. group of people in the world. And Jesus, Jesus said that he, when the crowd wanted to stone the sinner, he said that he who is without sin cast the first right. stone. And he said, he said um, when he talked about the religious elite, those were the ones that he wasn't so charitable towards. He said, they're a generation of vipers, they're hypocrites, they make clean the outside of the platter, but inside are ravenous wolves. And he said, all of us are sinners. And he said that if, if you lust after a woman in your heart, it's the same as if you committed adultery. So none of us can, can claim to be any better than the other. But so many so-called Christians, and it gets so, I get so mad reading those comments on Twitter. <laughs> Trust I've me, got, I've, I've had got my share, Dr. Falwell. Sam, <laughs> Sam, Sam Stone, help me. I got some draft tweets, and my, my wife wouldn't let me send. All right, some will read one. All right. <laughs> During my lifetime, before Donald Trump, but since I was born in 1962, two Democratic presidents were notorious adulterers in the White House, two Democratic presidents admitted to using illegal drugs, six presidents cursed vilely all the time, one was divorced, three committed crimes in office, and yet Liberals say Donald Trump is too flawed to support. Now, Jesus said, judge not, and he who is without sin casts the first stone. That's a tweet. Becky wouldn't let me send. Will you guys let me send it? <laughs> ra 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 raise your hand if it's a yes. <laughs> That's a lot of—that's that, like the longest tweet ever, too. That, how'd you get all that in? I got it in. I got it in. Anyway, um, I got a whole list of drafts that she wouldn't let me send, and I, I can't read the rest of them. But all I'm saying is—all I'm saying is, is that Jesus yeah. was on the side of, of the sinner and the, the repentant sinner, and he just said, go and send no more. And that's, that's what Christians—they they just are all—so many are just—, are just uh, their attitude is, my sin's better than your sin. That's right. So I'm better than you. You did this and this and this. But in their hearts, they're just as bad. Yeah. So that's just my opinion. I'm not a pastor. No, that's— Thank you. That's a good word. Thank you, sir. It's a good word. Hey, let me get you to do this. I really believe—can you, can you just bow your heads just, just for one second with me? And— I think the challenge from our president it can become very personal if we just begin with where he, where he took us, that all of us have sinned and fallen short to the glory of God, and that he without sin gets to cast the first stone, and the only one without sin decided not to cast a stone. God without sin decided to send his son instead of a stone our way. 
And so I don't know about you, but I, I want to today be reminded of the hour I first believed that. I want to be, be, I want to be reminded today that great forgiveness has come my way. Ridiculous, scandalous, tsunami-sized forgiveness has come my way. I need a lot of forgiveness, not just the day I got saved, but I continue to need it, to, need it today. Anybody here been greatly forgiven? Will you lift your hand if you don't believe you were greatly forgiven? That was what President Paul was talking about, the Pharisee thinking, I don't need as much forgiveness as someone else because I'm religious. If you've been greatly forgiven, then you get to greatly forgive. If you are rich in forgiveness, then you spend that richness, and it never ends. The more you spend it, the more you get. That's what Jill was talking about. And I think we can be the people of God who exemplify what grace and forgiveness looks like also in the confines of accountability and truth. No one can, can, condones the behavior of someone that God says is sin. We don't get to call something okay that God doesn't call okay. But at the same time, you and I have a responsibility as the people of God, as the people of grace, to be gracious, to be graceful. And I think that's what Jerry was reminding us of today as we kind of come to this moment. There might be someone that has really hurt you or someone who is um, very hard for you to forgive. And it would take, it's not natural, but it would be supernatural. It would take a supernatural act for you to be reminded that as God has greatly forgiven you, you can begin today to even pray, God, restore my heart, turn my heart against bitterness and anger and judgment. And even if, if you're holding out judgment until they're dead, until they finish, like he was reminding us, then why would I think I can be different? And maybe today you can begin to ask the Holy Spirit to put forgiveness in your heart. Some of you are asking for someone to forgive you who's never going to ask you. You've given them all the power. You're asking for someone to ask for repentance, or to, to repent. They're not going to repent. They're, some of you are asking for someone to forgive you. They've hurt you. They've moved on. And every day you love God and you hate them. And they've hurt you, and they continue to have that power over you. And today, man, as much as hurt people hurt people, healed people can heal people. Receive the forgiveness of God beyond your own forgiveness, and then dispense it. Begin to say, I dispense it. That doesn't mean you can condone what they're doing. That doesn't mean you have to get back into relationship. That doesn't mean that qualifies them back into positions or whatever. That just means that, God, I'm willing to do something supernatural. The same forgiveness that was given to me. I'm going to dispense to my brother and my sister. Lord, thank you for this. Thank you that you speak to us. Thank you for um, this moment where I'm reminded of the dreadful, wicked sinner that I was before salvation came into my life. Thank you for the bones that you have crushed that get to rejoice, how tragedy can be made into testimony. And Lord, even as I, as I hear Jerry, just be honest and transparent about his frustrations of seeing just so easily the people of God just pass out judgment, pass out critique. I pray that we would be stewards of what we say in public about people that matter to you. Just hearing the, the Freeze family today, Lord, I'm so reminded that behind everything that we see on TV or we hear about on the news is a family or people that matter to you. Let us be known for scandalous forgiveness. Let us begin to look in the mirror first. Thank you, God, for this moment to wake us up to that. I needed that today. We pray this in your name. Amen. Hey, can we thank our guests today, and can we thank our president as well, just for honesty? We love you guys. Hey, we'll see you tonight. Hillsong will be in this room with us leading, so come join us, all right? You're dismissed.